Thank you everybody for coming to this year's Joel Lecture, um, 2023. We obviously missed one or two, but then we caught up and we're now back to a, a series of Joel Lectures. And I have to say it's quite an exciting time, I think, tonight because we have a, a very special speaker that's going to tell us lots of interesting things. But I was going to start by introducing the reason why we have this lecture, really. And that is to celebrate the fact that um, UCL has the oldest chair in medical physics in the world. It was established in 1920, and so it's 103 years old. And I was going to give you a little bit of a history lesson just to tell you what had happened to build up to the development of the, of the Joel chair. And I start quite early on. This is, this is when the medical school was uh, established at the Middlesex Hospital Medical School. Uh, in 1745, um, so, sorry, I've got that wrong straight away, haven't I? This is when the medical school was established. I can't even read my own slide. I apologise for that. And prior to that, the Middlesex Hospital had built up quite a reputation for radiotherapy. And then we go along this period where the University College Hospital also had a medical school that started within the 12 months of each other. In this period, some massive undertakings um, developed a lot of x-ray techniques, or at least the beginnings of x-ray techniques. And in that same period, there were two guys that had a, a, a pivotal role in, in the development of this Joel chair. And these are the two people here. Uh, they're part of the Joel Bonato family. And they are from the east end of London, uh, from a relatively modest background initially. They were born in 1850, around that time. And within 30 years, they had moved to South Africa they had developed a mining interest for both um, diamonds as well as gold. And they made a small fortune and sold up their business to De Beers, the very large um, diamond um, company. And they sold that business for five and a half million pounds. And based on that, they then went into other developments in South Africa and eventually came back to the UK. And they made a large bequest to the Middlesex Hospital and they wanted the Middlesex Hospital, and they made that bequest in 1912, they wanted the Middlesex Hospital to develop their radiotherapy techniques further. So they, they decided in the end, that the, with, with the council of the Middlesex Hospital, that they would have three appointments, in, one in the Department of Surgery, one in the Department of Chemistry, probably now more closer to biochemistry, and one in physics. And it was the Joel Chair in Physics that was established in 1920. And that chair was occupied by, by Sidney Russ, who was one of the early pioneers of medical physics applied in hospital work. And the Joel Chair has therefore been held originally by the Middlesex Hospital Medical School. But the important thing is that it merged with University College Hospital Medical School. At one time, they thought they might call it the Unisex Medical School, but that was decided against. And instead, it became a joint medical school, and then that medical school joined with UCL. So the Joel Chair transferred to UCL. Um, I think that's enough of the history of the Joel Chair. So the reason we're here is because it's a, a relatively important chair, uh, being the only one that was established fairly early on and has since continued. But I want you to say a few words about tonight's speaker, um, if I can find my notes, because... Um, Claire has so many things for me to tell you that I needed a, a written piece of paper. Um, let, me, let, me, let me run through one or two of these. Um, she is currently the director of the Near Infrared Spectroscopy Research Group here at UCL and also vice dean for impact for the Faculty of Engineering Sciences. But that's not all. She's got many honorary positions in many universities and hospitals, both in the UK and abroad. She has research projects in a wide range from autism, acute brain injury, sports performance, migraine, and malaria. And she's started many international aspects of her research. And those have led to various things. For example, the Global Functional Near-Infrared initi Spectroscopy Initiative. And also, she's founder and trustee of the Charity for Young Scientists in Africa. And these, I think, give a good idea of how broad her impact has been. And she really is an ambassador for UCL and for the area of this department, medical physics and bioengineering. 
She's been supported by a range of research council funds, charity funds, industrial collaborations. And she's also been several awards, really. And I was going to just list one or two of the awards here. Um, the Provost Public Engagement Award, the MRC Science Suffrage Award, Inspirational Teacher Award in the UK, Women in Science and Engineering Research Award, UCL Engineering Engagement Outstanding Contribution Award, British Science Association Media Fellowship to work with the Financial Times. And that's just a small selection of the awards that she's had. But I, when I looked up this and I found it, I noticed there was one award that was not mentioned. And I felt it was quite important to let you know that she is, in fact, a, an Olympic gold medalist. Um, myself also. Um, we are, in fact, joint holders of the gold medal. And the award I'm talking about, and in fact, I brought my medal along today. I'm not sure if Claire keeps hers quite as close to herself as this one, and I have it here. Um, Jem, our head of department in those days, in 19, uh, 2012, sorry, Jem, not 1912, <laughs> 2012, organized a two-day getaway, um, which was both for scientific discussion, but also we arranged a pentathlon event during that, that time we were away. And at the end of the two days, we got to the final event, which was an egg and spoon race. There was a, um, a slight um, problem, I think, that one of the teams was accused of using blue tack, um, <laughs> but that was never accepted. And instead, Jem kept the peace by donating both of us. To, as we were leaders of teams, by the way. We weren't individuals. Leaders of teams. So I think you've heard enough from me, and instead I'm going to ask Claire to come along and give her lecture tonight for the Joel Lecture for uh, 2023. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to be here. And I, I just want to start by saying it's an absolute honour to have been invited to give this lecture in honour of the Joel Chair. Uh, and it's a real pleasure, isn't it, to be back together in person with everyone. And it's really lovely to see all my amazing colleagues here. Um, and my friends and family that I've restricted to the front row so I can keep an eye on you all. I'm expecting heckling, so that's why I need to know at all times where you are. Um, so here's the title of my talk, but actually the more accessible title of my talk is this one. Blood, Babies, Brains and Bill Gates. And that's really what I've spent the last 30 years working on. I'm going to talk about my research and everything to do with blood, babies, brains and a little bit about Bill Gates. Um, but actually, what I thought I'd do for this lecture is weave in my personal story of my career, really to give a flavour of how I've led, I think, quite an unpredictable path uh, in my career and, and what's taken me into all of the various projects that I've been working on. So it starts with my education. I attended a state school in Croydon uh, called Coloma, where I studied maths, physics and chemistry. I was taught physics by a nun, which was an interesting experience. And actually, my daughter, Julia, went to the same school, and she achieved the heights of becoming head girl. I didn't achieve those heights because I was too busy smuggling boys into the sixth form block. Um, so I had an interest always in maths and physics, uh, but I also had an interest in medicine. So for as long as I can remember, everyone said to me that I was going to become a doctor. And I knew that I wasn't that keen on biology and chemistry. And I thought, I'm not going to do very well at medical school if I don't like the squishy stuff. So I was very lucky that in the summer of 1984, when I was 17, um, I was enabled to attend an event called the London International Youth Science Forum. I was sponsored by BP to go to this event. This event gathers hundreds of students from all over the world uh, for a two-week residential science forum uh, in central London every summer. And because of my interest in medicine, I went to anything that had medical in the title. So this is the programme for the event that I went to. And you can see it's a series of lectures and debates and visits and social events. Um, and I choose to go on a visit to the Royal Marsden Hospital in Sutton. And when I went to that uh, visit, I met my first ever medical physicist. I'd never heard of medical physics before. But I met a medical physicist and I was introduced to the discipline and immediately I had that light bulb moment, which I think I was incredibly lucky to have because I realised this was the way of merging my interest in maths and physics uh, and my love for medicine. Um, and in that moment, I decided that that's what I was going to do. 
Um, so I went back to my school and spoke to them about medical physics degrees, and they'd never heard of it. And they actually tried to persuade me quite hard to actually do medicine, because this was a very unknown. And also my careers teacher, who was a German teacher, said, you can't do physics, Claire, it's too hard. Um, and I thought, well, that's a jolly good reason to do physics then. Um, so I read physics with medical physics at the University of Exeter and had an amazing time there. Um, and then because I loved my degree and everything that I was taught there, um, I was really keen to start working as a medical physicist, which I did at the local hospital there um, in Exeter. Um, and while I was there, I did a master's degree, a research master's degree, in the very glamorous topic of old men snoring. So I did a master's degree in sleep apnea, which is when people stop breathing when they go to sleep. So my time there was spent sitting up awake watching old men snore. So don't, don't let anyone tell you there's no glamour in medical physics. So around this time, I met a guy, and he was in London, and I thought, and he did turn out to be my husband, um, I thought, I think I'm going to move back to London. Um, and so then I started to put feelers out for jobs in medical physics. And that's when I was introduced to Dave Delpy uh, by a mutual colleague of ours. Uh, someone in, in the Exeter Medical Physics Department knew Dave and had worked with Dave and said, if you're going to do medical physics in London, you have to do it at UCL with Dave Delpy. And Dave gave me, gave me a ring and told me about this job that was available as a research assistant in the Department of Paediatrics. It was six months before the end of a five-year grant and somebody had left. And he was very straightforward and said, we've only got six months of money and there's no guarantee that the grant will be renewed. Um, so I left a permanent secure position in Exeter, in the NHS, for six months of money here at UCL. And within, I think, three or four months of me joining, the, the funds for the next five years of research were secured. So it was a risk, but it was one of the best decisions that I'd ever made. And the research assistant post was to work with these particularly vulnerable patients. This is a premature baby born at 24 weeks gestation, the normal pregnancy being 40 weeks. So this baby's born 16 weeks premature. And the question that the team that I was working with was trying to, trying to address was to understand the consequences of prematurity on these little babies' brains. So actually, the survival rates of these babies are pretty good. The clinical management of these babies has improved enormously. But there are concerns about what's happening in their brains at this very critical period. These babies are vulnerable to strokes and bleeds, and those could lead to devastating consequences and handicaps. So you can imagine that the type of solutions for this challenge are fairly narrow because of the types of patients that we're dealing with. And this really introduced me very clearly to the concept of really what medical physics and bioengineering is. And my definition, I'm sure many of your definitions is, it's addressing an unmet clinical need with innovative physics and engineering solutions. And both of the parts of that sentence are so important. We only want to solve question, questions that are challenges that actually exist. So they have to be driven by the end user. And in this case, they have to be driven by the clinical team. But also, we don't want to work on boring stuff. We want to work on stuff that's going to be challenging and is going to push the boundaries of physics and engineering. That's where the exciting transformations are going to happen. And in these tiny babies, we can't use conventional imaging. It is possible to do magnetic resonance imaging, which I guess most of us would say is the gold standard of brain imaging. But it's difficult. You've got to transfer these babies in their incubators in a completely metal-free environment into a magnet. You can do ultrasound imaging, which is non-invasive, and you can do it at the bedside, but the resolution of those images isn't sufficient for what the clinicians wanted to understand about what was going on in the brain. And so, as physicists and engineers, Dave's group and others had gone to their happy place. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum, which is just basically radiation in its different forms. And so we can look along this spectrum, and we can recognize the types of radiation that are already used in medical imaging. So radio waves are important in magnetic resonance imaging. And of course, most of you will be familiar with the idea of using X-rays, either to image the body, so the lower energy X-rays, or to treat the body in terms of radiotherapy with higher energy X-rays and gamma rays. The area that um, Dave and others had focused on was the optical radiation. And if we look at this region here, the visible part of that is a very thin sliver. 
But even with visible optical radiation, just with white light that you're looking at each other with now, we can still find out quite a lot about the human body. If we just look at these two tubes of blood, this is a photograph I took on the intensive care unit at Great Ormond Street Hospital and a study that we were doing there, where babies were undergoing a treatment where their heart and lungs were failing. And so the blood was taken out of their body and then put through an artificial oxygenation system and then re-put back into their body. So the lower tube is the blood that's come out of this baby that's really deprived of oxygen. And then the, the top tube, the red tube, is the tube of blood going back in that's been fully oxygenated. So you can quite, sli quite clearly see the difference in the colour of the blood in those two tubes. And that's because of the different amounts of oxygen that's being carried in that blood. So if we can manage, if we can measure the colour of the blood, then we can work out how much oxygen it contains. And of course, this is very easy to see in a clear tube when the blood is out of the body. How do we do that in terms of in vivo? Well, let's just do a little demo. So my brother brought this torch, which was very handy. So uh, white light source, straightforward. You could use the flash point on your uh, iPhone. So just put my thumb in front of the white light, and immediately it glows red. And that's because the hemoglobin in the blood, in the tissue, in my finger, is fully loaded with oxygen. And so the light that's returning, that's transmitting through my finger, is representing the colour of that blood, which is red. So many people would have said that I've spent most of my career working on a glorified torch. That's probably a fair assessment. But it has taken me to some interesting places, as you will hear. So in terms of what I've just done, we've put white light of all different colours into the finger and we've seen red light coming out. And that's telling me that the tissue contains red oxygenated blood. The problem is I'm not really interested in fingers, interested in brains. So if we try and do this now, we're not going to get very far because the white light's not going to trans transmit through my head, but mostly it's not going to transmit through my skull. So we need to do some clever physics. And the clever thing that we do with the physics is slide beyond the visible part of the spectrum into the near infrared. And these are the types of wavelengths that you might um, be using with your TV remote control. So they're invisible to the naked eye, but they have a very useful uh, phenomena. This is a hand that's been transilluminated with not, opt uh, not white, a visible light, but near infrared light. And what you cannot see in the hand here are any bones. And that's because the bone is transparent to this wavelength of light, transparent to the near infrared. And for that reason, we can shine not white, but near infrared light through the skull, into the brain, and do exactly what we did with my finger, see what colour the brain glows, and that will tell us how much oxygen is being carried in the brain. So in terms of the challenge that we had for the preterm infants on the intensive care unit, systems were developed that enabled the delivery of this near-infrared light through optical fibres to the baby's head, and then sensitive light detection systems that essentially looked at the colour of the blood that emerged. That information is taken to a computer that had an algorithm that transferred the attenuation, the sort of colour of the light, into the concentrations of both oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So that's the principle of the glorified torch. And in practice, the clinical team that I was joining in the Department of Paediatrics had successfully started to show that this technique worked in babies. And this is like a photo opportunity baby here. Um, most people who do optics would say that baby's got a lot of dark hair. Is that a problem? And actually, it's not a problem, but um, it, it, it doesn't also look like a, a, you know, it looks thankfully like a very healthy baby. This is more like the babies that Dave and his team were studying when I joined the group. So this baby is another premature baby. The business end of keeping this baby alive is all focused around the ventilator, the feeding tube, the other monitors on the baby's chest. So the other thing about bringing brain imaging into this environment is to make sure that we don't disturb any of that. So you can just see the two black probes on the baby's head. That, those probes are delivering and receiving the near-infrared light that's enabling the measurements of the oxygen levels in that baby's brain. So if we go back to the picture that I showed you earlier, the black lead here is an optical fibre, and the near-infrared spectroscopy probes are just underneath this, these babies' bonnets. So the name of our technique is near-infrared spectroscopy because it uses near-infrared light, and spectroscopy is just a method of measuring the colour of something. And so I started work with Dave and his clinical colleague, John Wyatt, on the neonatal unit. And what I love about this photo, it's, I think, the epitome of multidisciplinary collaboration because Dave, who's sitting in the front here, is the one manipulating the baby. 
And John Wyatt, who's the clinical guy, Dave being an engineer, is standing there actually very calmly <laughs> with full trust that Dave knows what he's doing. And I learnt so much from watching John and Dave. I learnt the importance of communication and collaboration and sometimes keeping your mouth shut and your ears open and understanding the context of being working in that clinical environment. Meanwhile, I was spending my time going between the neonatal unit and the laser labs that we had in the medical physics department just across the road. So some of the work that I was involved in there was uh, in this particular experiment, in this photograph, I was looking at measuring the time of flight of the light through different sections of tissue using really sensitive uh, lasers and camera detection systems. And because Dave and others had shown the feasibility of this type of technology for measuring brain oxygenation in these small babies, uh, they managed to secure industrial funding from a collaborator called Hamamatsu, a Japanese company. Um, and Jap the Japanese company developed the first commercial near infrared spectroscopy system called the Niro 1000. And it was called Niro because that was easier to say in Japanese than NIR. Um, and so I spent a lot of time sitting by babies' cots, watching these red lines going up and down, indicating the oxygen levels in this baby's brain. And Dave and others worked really hard on creating techniques that allowed us to find out really important things about the status of these babies' brains. So I'd been working in the department by that point for about six months, and Dave came to me and said, have you thought about doing a PhD? And I said, no, and for two reasons. First of all, it's an awful lot of hard work. And secondly, I'm not clever enough to do that. And Dave, in his very wise way, said, if you change your mind, come and talk to me. So over the course of the next few months, I took a look at all the other people around me who were getting PhDs, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> if they can do it, yeah. I'm going to have a crack. So I went and saw Dave, and I said, oh, about that PhD conversation. And Dave just had that look on his face of, I've been expecting you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started my PhD with a suggestion again from Dave, which was, we've got this technology working in babies, but we really want to see whether we can use it in adults. And no one had really attempted to do it in adults. Now, the problem with adults is, imagine a very small baby head. It's like optically transparent. You could almost shine a torch through it. Not quite the same with an adult head. So my PhD was focused on developing techniques, both measurement and analysis techniques, to investigate um, cerebral oxygenation, brain oxygenation in adults. So I was working a lot in the lab doing studies on human volunteers like these. But I was very lucky to meet two people that really changed the course of my career at this stage. Uh, one of those was Hugh Owen Rees. He was actually an anaesthetist, but he was working on the neonatal unit. That's where I met him. But he introduced me to Martin Smith, who's a consultant neuroanesthetist, also sitting in the front row and likely to heckle at any moment, um, who uh, ran the neuro, adult neurointensive care unit at the National Hospital, for, National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And so for part of my PhD, I took my studies out of the laboratory in medical physics and into the clinic. So this is a typical adult neurointensive care bed. Uh, we have a patient that's brain injured, surrounded by lots of different monitors. And the unmet need in this situation is very similar to that in the neonatal unit. The clinicians looking after these patients want to understand how best to help these patients to recover and also to see whether they are capable of a meaningful recovery. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about the types of techniques that we could use that we could get to work in adults. And we did a lot of work and published a lot of papers. And it was very interesting to see the different ways in which this technology could be used. So as well as doing studies on these patients in intensive care, we also did studies on neurosurgery patients. And these were studies where we actually were placing our optical sources and detectors directly on the brain tissue. So these studies were having a weight craniotomy, so the skull was removed. And we wanted to have a look at the influence of the skull on our signals. And we thought there was no better way of doing this than doing measurements on the outside of the skull and then on the direct brain measures once the skull had been removed. And this was all done in collaboration with the neurosurgeons um, at the National Hospital. Again, really insightful, really important, and I learned so much. So doctors like, like Martin are natural teachers 
Doctors teach each other all the time. So if you just spend time in these environments and listen and turn up to the hideously early meetings at 6 a.m. or something, um, you will learn a lot. And that's really, for me, the heart of these interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, and the other thing that's important is to start understanding the language as a physicist that you need to speak to make yourself understood uh, for somebody who's not in your own discipline. And around this time, it was clear that the Hamamatsu systems were really taking off and becoming very popular. And this is the next generation of Hamamatsu system, the Niro 500. I did warn them, you don't want to go down in the numbers, because they'd gone from Niro 1000 to 500, but they ignored me. thought that's going to be quite self-limiting. But anyway, and then around this time, Dave said to me, do you know what, there's lots of people that are asking you questions like technical support. And that wasn't my role. I wasn't employed by Hamamatsu. And he said, I think you should... Um, you should just do a little leaflet, you know, like frequently asked questions, so you can just hand it out to people. So I said, okay, that, that sort of sounds like a good idea. That, that won't be much work. So um, in the same month that I published my PhD, I also published this book, which is The Practical User's Guide to Near Infrared Spectroscopy. I don't know what your definition of a leaflet is, Dave, but <laughs> he was like, just add that in, just add that in. Um, and this, again, was a bit of a game changer because... Lots of people wanted to know more about the technology. And so they were given this book. And I, my profile just rose because people realised I knew about this stuff. So, and also from J Dave's generosity, he was very good at saying, oh, I've been invited to give this talk in Berlin. I really can't go, but I'd like you to go. So I've told them that you're going. So I turn up. They were expecting Professor Dave Delpy, the godfather of this technology, and then they, they got me. It was fresh out of my PhD. But again, that was an opportunity for me to really cut my teeth and understanding not just what was going on in my own laboratory, but how we communicated that to other research groups. So I'd done my PhD, and I was working on the, on the uh, adult intensive care unit, and Dave said, you really ought to apply for your own funding. So I applied for both a Wellcome Trust and an MRC, uh, non-clinical training fellowships. And for those of you who are not in academia, these are the ways to get your first own funding and start your own research groups. And I was awarded the Medical Research Council non-clinical training fellowship on the same day that I discovered I was pregnant with, with my daughter. And spoke to the MRC about this, and they said, oh, we've never been in this situation before. Um, I wasn't wholly surprised about that. But it worked in my favour because they said, well, just tell us what you'd like, how you'd like to manage this. Um, so I said, well, I'd like to still have the fellowship. It was a three-year full-time fellowship. So I said, but I'd like it to be extended to five years so I can work part-time. And they said yes. So if you don't ask, you don't get. So once I'd had with, um, Julia, I went to work uh, and I returned to work three days a week. And two years later, I had my son, Joe. Um, and I was on maternity leave with Joe when Dave said Mark Cope, who was another founder of the technology, was leaving UCL, and there was therefore a vacancy for a lecturer. So I didn't apply because I just thought, I am work part-time, I don't want to go full-time. Um, but the night before the deadline, I put an application in, and I put a covering letter to say, happy to apply for this, but I want to continue to work part time because I thought I just wanted to be transparent about my situation. Um, and I was appointed lecturer um, uh, at, at that time. So I continued to work three days a week um, for a number of years and continued to volunteer my own children for medical research. <laughs> so I had got the fellowship. I'd returned to work from two lots of maternity leave. But I was hungry to do more work, and that needed more money. And I had, I thought, a really good idea of what we should do on the adult neurointensive care unit. I wanted to create what I called a multimodal monitoring unit. And so I wrote this grant, this application for funding, about what I knew, which was measuring haemoglobin and oxygen. And that was squarely rejected. So I thought, well, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to, going to write another one to another funder. That was squarely rejected. And, of course, at this point, you'll think, well, that's it. I'm giving up on academia. They, no, no one knows, you know, how important my idea is. I'm not being heard, and I think I'm just going to go and do something else. Um, and then when I calmed down a bit, I thought, well, actually, I should probably read the reviewer's comments and work out why they didn't give me the money. So to this day, I still don't know who this reviewer is. If you happen to be in the room, please make yourself known to me, and I will definitely buy you a beer. This was the comment, and... Those of you that have heard me speak about this before have heard this, this quote. 
It's the best quote I think you could ever put on a grant application. The reviewer told me to measure the important rather than making the measurable important. And I think that's something we really need to hold on to. We're very good sometimes as physicists and engineers to be very proud of the stuff that we can measure rather than thinking, is that really what anybody needs to know? So I'm just going to do a tiny bit of biochemistry to explain what I mean by this. So this is a sketch of something called the respiratory electron chain. And this is basically a description of how oxygen powers a cell, right, to keep it alive. So you have oxygen being carried on the haemoglobin that's carried in the red blood. And the oxygen comes off the haemoglobin into the cell, and it's metabolized by an enzyme called cytochrome. And it's the metabolism of oxygen by this enzyme that produces something called ATP, which is basically the fuel for the cell. So this is the process that really tells you whether a cell is working properly. Now, we know that we can measure haemoglobin uh, using near-infrared spectroscopy because it just changes colour, but actually so does cytochrome. And even though the colour change isn't in the visible part of the spectrum as it is with haemoglobin, we can still measure it using near-infrared spectroscopy. And so I became, along with others, and Ilias, who's in the room, was absolutely pivotal to this work in working out how we could measure this particular enzyme because we knew that it was super important because it really got to the heart of what was going on with what we call cellular energetics. Um, the, the equipment for this was complex, and I would say this was de definitely not a glorified torch. Um, it required us to make the measurements in a much more specific manner. Um, but we managed to do this, and just bringing you to where we got to with this particular project, we actually managed to get to the point where we were imaging for the first time ever oxygen metabolism in brain-injured patients. So we could get concurrent images of the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and then oxygen metabolism at the same time. And this was focused on to understanding the process of cellular energetics during brain injury. Because if someone has a brain injury, part of their brain dies, but then other bits of their brain are still liable to potentially being recoverable. But we need to understand what status that part of the brain is in. And also, importantly, these types of measures can help inform the types of interventions, therapeutic interventions, that could help these patients. We went on from this also to develop two different markers, which I think were really important. One was looking at the correlation between blood pressure and, metab and metabolic. So we call this a metabolic reactivity plot. And the other was looking at the correlation between activity measured with electrical signals in the brain and, um, and metabolism, which we labeled neurometabolic metabolic coupling. And I think this project I'm particularly proud of because it was really the, the impact of amazing collaborations. Myself and Martin, myself a physicist, Martin a clinician, Ilias and Martin Tisdell, Ilias an engineer, Martin Tisdell a neurosurgeon, David Heighton, who's mentioned in the paper here, who's a neuroanesthetist, and Fong Fang, who was an intercalated medical student who did a PhD with us, a very bright engineer. And it shows me exactly where the, the sweet spots are with interdisciplinary research. If you get the funding for those two different disciplines to work together, that's where the step changes in the research happens. So I was doing this work in adult intensive care, but I was also still keeping an eye on what was going on with the baby work. And during this time, I was approached by a group from the Centre for Brain and Cognitive Development from Birkbeck. And they'd seen the work that had been going on in neonates, and they were interested to see whether any of those technologies could be transferred to babies slightly older. So these are babies in the first 6 to 12 months of life. They were studying these babies because they wanted to look at the brain development of these infants, and they needed to understand more about what's going on in these babies' brains. Now, these are a very different type of um, subject and, and patient. They're not a patient, but a subject to try and put optical imaging on. So with the neonates, yes, they're very vulnerable and they're delicate, but they don't go anywhere. They are stationary in the cot. Uh, meanwhile, these babies are quite capable of moving their heads and potentially moving around. So at the same time, in parallel, there was a lot of amazing engineering developments going on, led by Jem Hebden and Nick Everdell, in creating systems that allowed us not to just look at brain oxygenation in one region of the brain, but to map it across the entire, across the entire brain. So that worked by having not one source and detector, but having multiple sources and detectors that were shining light through different parts of the brain. And as they did so, creating a color map of the oxygen levels in the baby's brain. And then we can imagine that we can say, well, there's a certain amount of oxygen in this baby's brain, 
denoted here with the uh, white circles. If we give the baby something to do, something to look at or something to listen to or something to feel, part of the baby's brain that's processing that information will start using oxygen. And as the oxygen's being used up, we can see the colour map change. So this is a way of getting simultaneous maps of oxygenation across the baby's brain now to look at brain function, which was the real key that we wanted to get to and what this group at Birkbeck wanted to understand. So this is the theory. This is what we needed to build. And this is what was built, alongside an amazing imaging system, actually, that, that Jen built. So this is the UCL near-infrared system called the NTS system, which I think stands for NICS topography system. Um, it's, it's, a very amaz it's an amazing system because it does everything you want it to do exactly as you want it to do it. It produces the spectroscopy data that you want, but because of the way in which the signals are multiplexed, both the source and detector, it allows a really flexible geometry of where you can measure on the brain. So you can get simultaneous measures on the brain. And if, for example, you want to change the alignment of the uh, probes on the brain, uh, on the headgear, you can just swap them around and measure whichever brain regions you want. Now, the, the physics and engineering in, in this is, is good, but the, the real important thing with these studies, particularly with babies, is to get the front end right. So Anna Blasey, who's in the room here, and Sarah Lloyd-Fox. So Anna's an engineer. We employed Anna and Sarah Lloyd-Fox, who's a neurodevelopmental psychologist, to work on developing this optical headgear. So we started off with an approach where we just had the fibres basically perpendicular to the baby's head. Um, we lost probably about 60% of our data because it was very unstable and we weren't getting good coupling on the baby's head. We solved that in part by putting a little prism uh, in the fibre so that we could bend the light through 90 degrees and this gave us a much neater headgear to put on the baby's head. That worked up to a point but we had light losses at the prism interface. So we then worked with an optical fibre company called Loptech who developed a curved fibre, which were very unusual at that time, which meant the light would just go around this bend and it enabled us to create this plug-and-play uh, optical fibre system, which really was the game-changer in opening the doorway to doing functional near-infrared spectroscopy studies on a whole array of infants. And this is just a selection of some of the infants that we studied at the Centre for Brain and Cognitive Development in their baby lab. So when we talk about measuring brain function, what do I actually mean? Well, here's our baby with the headgear on, and we're measuring the colour of the baby's blood at all different regions of the brain. So now let's imagine that we show that baby a visual stimulus, something that's going to activate their visual cortex. What we see in each of these individual channels is the presence or absence of this increase in oxygenation. This is the red line showing the increase in oxygenation. This is the red line showing the, the blood getting redder, right? So this is a signature to show that part of the baby's brain is active and processing that information. Imagine that we have multiple signatures uh, of different sizes because not each part of the brain is going to be activated. We then combine those into an image, and the red spot on this image is showing us the centre of activation for this baby's brain. So that's the, that's the process by which we understand brain function using this technique. So Sarah Lloyd-Fox, who I've already mentioned was doing a PhD at the time, and she really pioneered the use of this technology in understanding brain function in infants. These are some photographs from her study. So this is an infant, first of all, looking at a social image. This is the actress on this screen is doing Itsy Bitsy Spider. And then we intersposed this with uh, uh, images of, of non-social, uh, so like trains, planes, helicopters, tractors. Now, we knew... But there's a lot of studies that have already been done looking at the behaviour of infants when they looked at these two different types of images. So this is a video of an infant just looking at different types of images. And what you can see is that we've got the headgear on this baby. It's a very old video, so the version of headgear does look a bit blue peter. Um, but it stayed on the head, which was good. So this is on a loop. So now, at the moment, the baby's watching the trains, planes, helicopters, automobiles. That baby's actually not interested in what's going on on the screen. She's looking at her blanket and not particularly interested. In a minute, the actress is going to come on the screen, see in the corner doing Itsy Bitsy Spider, and you can immediately say that baby's behaviour change. That baby's engaging with a human. The, the brain is recognising that that's a human uh, interaction, uh, not interacting with an inanimate object. Sarah did uh, a range of these studies in infants, and the, the aim of this study was to look at infants at risk of autism. 
So she did studies, first of all, in a group of infants at low risk of autism, no family history of autism. And these were the data that she got from that group. So the red line, again, is showing the increase in brain oxygenation when they're looking at the social, the itsy-bitsy spider actress. She repeated exactly the same study in a group of infants with high risk of autism, and these are infants that had a sibling with autism. Now, it's just worth saying that all of these infants were studied between four and six months of age, and autism isn't diagnosed clinically until the second or third year of life. So this is way before any behavioural signs would have been evident. And these are the data that she got from the high-risk infants. So we can see a very moderated response in the oxygen levels when the baby was looking at the social. And it's almost as if these babies are not seeing the difference between a human and a tractor. And if you looked at the difference in the behaviour, you wouldn't have spotted any difference in the behaviour between these two groups. You had to be looking at what was going on in the brain. So this was the first time that anyone had shown that as young as four months of age, we could use brain imaging to start understand babies' responses to the world around them. So these babies were followed up. They aged to the point where they could have a clinical diagnosis assessment of autism. So Sarah followed these babies up. And she looked at how the responses that had been measured at four to six months of age correlated with the outcome of the clinical assessment for autism. So again, on the slide that I'm showing you here, the green is the cohort of low-risk infants showing that nice response, and the purple is the cohort of high-risk infants showing the moderated response. What she did was split them into different groups depending on the autism diagnosis. So in the low-risk group, none of the infants went on to be diagnosed as autistic. In the high-risk group, those infants that were not diagnosed as autistic still had a positive response. But if we just look at the infants that were in the high-risk group that did receive an autism diagnosis at three years, those are the infants that had a moderated negative response. And so this was the first time that anyone had shown that the brain responses that we measure in the first six months of life are associated with autism outcome, outcome in toddlerhood. And... We are still understanding lots about autism, but, but I, want, I think the one thing that everyone would agree, agree on is, is the earlier it is diagnosed, uh, the earlier some interventions, if appropriate, uh, can be um, implemented for these infants. So I think this is a really important piece of work, and I, I would give full credit here to Sarah uh, for pursuing this work and doing it so diligently. Um, at the time, we were interested in expanding the use of the technology. This is an example of doing baby-to-baby -baby interactions, two babies connected to the same imaging system. So we can start to look at how babies not just interact with the world around them, but also with each other. And most recently, we have the opening of the world's first toddler lab at Birkbeck. And my niece here, Lizzie, has got a four-year-old who uh, we're carrying on the family tradition of donating our children's brains to science. In fact, I must get a picture of Ollie for this slide. Um, so what's happening now is this amazing coincidence of technology. So what we've got now are wearable near-infrared spectroscopy systems. So the infants uh, have got a little backpack which contains all the electronics for the system, but they're just wearing a little bit of headgear. That's all they think they're having a game. But the real game changer is that they are now engaging with a virtual reality environment that we can program. So the uh, figure that I'm showing you here is from a study being led by uh, one of the researchers that's worked in my group, Chiara Bulgarelli, and she's looking at the development of um, empathy in toddlers. So this toddler will be playing with an avatar that she's chosen, and she will build a relationship with this avatar, and then the avatar will fall over. And what we're looking is at the, brain, the baby's brain responses to what happens when that avatar falls over, and looking at the development of autism at this really early stage. So this is incredible now where this work has taken us, but it's just started with pretty simple collaboration, seeing whether we could get this technology to work in this age group of infants. So meanwhile, meanwhile what was happening to my career? Well, by this point, I'd been promoted to senior lecturer, and I'd increased my hours from three to four days a week. And then, in, in, in common with lots of women at this stage of their careers, um, I just assumed the next step was out of reach. And... Unfortunately, that is true that many women have, are, are not forthcoming in putting themselves forward for promotion. But I was very lucky to attend a women's only promotion workshop, which was run by the head of HR at UCL at that time. And I met a professor of chemistry, a female professor of chemistry, who sat on the promotion panel. 
And she said, I think you ought to send me a copy of your CV and I'll give you some honest guidance of whether I think you're ready to go for promotion to professor. So I did that and it turned out I was. So I was promoted to professor in 2008 while still working part time. And I think it's worth saying that the previous dean, not the one in this photo, had said to me, you'll never make professor part time. Um, I haven't found him yet, but when I do. Um, so, yeah, that was a big moment. I, you know, no expectation. I was the first person in my family to go to university. Zero expectation that I would uh, become a professor. And I remember, <laughs> I remember telling mum, and she just collapsed on the floor. Um, so, great, great moment. And I couldn't have been achieved without all of the people I've already mentioned. Um, so... What else was going on then was I was getting approached by lots of sort of random studies, um, people saying, do you think we could use brain imaging to do X, Y, and Z? Um, most of the time, the answer was a flat no. Um, but this study I was very intrigued with. We had a group from um, Oxford who were looking at malaria patients in India, and they wanted to understand more about cerebral uh, malarial coma. Um, and so they asked if they could borrow a system and take it out to India and start measuring these patients. So I was like, OK, we can train you up and we can help you design a project and design the studies. So they took the system out, and it didn't really go to plan. The infrastructure in the hospitals, as you can see, was not what we were used to dealing with. And this is my first experience of doing any type of global health work. But we had a really dedicated researcher on this project called Christina uh, Colliver. And she put a huge amount of time into this project. And I said, whatever happens, Christina, you've got to have an output from, from this, this project. So um, I encouraged her to write a short paper. It was proceedings for a conference, um, really just to describe some of the data that had been collected in these malaria patients. And I do remember, I didn't say this to her. I didn't want to dishearten her. But I do remember saying to myself, no one's going to read that paper. <laughs> but she needs it. She needs the output for her CV, and that's important for her. So um, it turned out that someone did read that paper, and they also had read Sarah's papers on the work that we were doing in the baby lab. And the group that read the papers were the Medical Research Council International Nutrition Group, led by uh, Andrew Prentice and Sophie Moore and the late Mamadou Darbo. And they read the paper, and they asked me a question, could we use near-infrared spectroscopy to image the brains of infants in Africa? to understand the impact of early years adversity. And that was quite a lot for me to unpack because I knew absolutely nothing about global health and I frankly didn't know anything about the experiences of infants in this part of the world. The field station that they work in is in a small village called Kenaba in a rather remote region of the Gambia. So I started reading up about what they were talking about. So the rather startling statistics is that half of the world's children are living in poverty and uh, this means that they're exposed to a range of different risk factors, including under and malnutrition, infectious and non-infectious diseases, low quality health care and inadequate early years education. All the things that we take for granted when we're nurturing and rearing our own children. And again, another rather startling statistic from this paper that was published in 2016 says that one in three, one third of preschool aged children in low and middle income countries are failing to meet their developmental milestones, either in cognitive or socio-emotional development, because of the early adversity that they suffer in the, in the first stages of their lives. And this equates to over 80 million children, most of whom are living in sub-Saharan Africa. So once I looked at some of the background to this, and I realised how enormous this problem was, and rather ashamed that I didn't know about it, I spoke to Andrew and Sophie and said, well, how are you currently measuring brain development in your infants? And they said, we measure the size of the baby's heads. And actually, this is a good thing to do, because if the brain's not growing, the head won't be growing. And their head circumference data, which is shown here, um, so this, these, this green line is the line that these infants should be achieving with their head growth if they were growing appropriately. And we can see that all of the babies that they measured are falling off that healthy growth line. And so there's clearly indications here that these babies' brains are not thriving. And so there's clearly work to be done in understanding why that is the case and, importantly, how we could intervene and protect these babies' brains. So, of course, the next part of the conversation was we're going to need some funding to do this. And that's when I was first introduced to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and particularly to a scheme called the Grand Challenges Exploration Scheme, which is the best grant application scheme to get involved with because the application is two page long. And the funding details are two lines long. Now, 
I don't know what things are currently, but it's for at least 120 pages probably, isn't it, now for Work Tribe and all that stuff. The amount of money that you got on the phase one was 100,000, and if you showed that you could use that money wisely, then you could be put into an application for phase two funding for a million dollars. The current success rate, the success rate when we applied for phase one for phase two funding was 2%. So it was definitely a carrot, but it was a very small carrot a long way away. So we put in an application uh, with a question, can we use functional neurofresh spectroscopy to understand brain function in Gambian infants over the first two years of life? And we got the money. So with the money, we built a, a, a scaled-down version of the uh, imaging system because we didn't have enough money to build a whole one. And we basically put it in a box and took it as excess luggage over to the Gambia. And we arrived at the field station. And these are all the boxes that we brought, either the bits that we stored in our suitcases or as excess luggage. This is the brain imaging system that we transported. And I'm just going to show you, um, very gr glad that I took these photos, what happens over the next couple of hours. So within an hour, Sarah, who's seen here, and uh, Maria Papadimitriou, who is a PhD. She's a, uh, Maria's a physicist on the team. Um, again, the physicist-psychology pairing. Um, were setting up the system, as they would do in London. And within an hour and a half, we were training a local field worker, Seiku. Uh, and in just over two hours, we had our first mother and baby come in for a study. Um, and so we ran a study just as we would do in the UK. The only adaptation that we made was we re refilmed the videos with uh, Gambian actors rather than UK actors. And just a few minutes later, we'd finished our first study. And this little lad looks really pleased and sl slightly startled, as he should do, because it turns out, and I'm still willing to have some, I've been saying this for 10 years, someone to correct me, this is the first baby to ever have their brain imaged in Africa. It just, it just took somebody to put it in a box and take it out there and make it happen. Um, and so we looked at the data from that first study. Sarah analysed it. And at, at 3 o'clock that afternoon, I was due to give a seminar at the field station to describe why we were there as a team and what our plan was. And it was amazing to be able to show them the data that we collected already that morning. So the data that I'm showing you here are the selected channels, the selected regions of this baby's brain that are showing this response to show brain activation. And so we'd shown in one baby this work. So the temptation is to pack up and go home then and say, we got it to work. But we didn't. We stayed. We, we studied another 41 babies um, who were in the age group four to eight months. We went back and followed those babies up a few months later and then a few months after that. So we got data on these babies um, up to um, 18 months and uh, 16 months. And then we did a cross-sectional study of 0 to 2 month olds and 18 to 24 months old because we'd promised the Gates Foundation that we'd look at uh, the feasibility of this technology over the first 1,000 days of life. And that is from conception, so that takes you up to the baby's second birthday. So this is a video of a, a little chap, probably about 18 months old, doing the study. And I, I show you this video for two reasons. The first is there were a number of people said we'd never get this to work, particularly in infants of this age. Um, and the second is it's very useful to have these videos on an iPad when you're trying to recruit mothers and babies because quite reasonably um, they will be worried about what you're asking them to do. Um, and it's very helpful to be able to say, my daughter and my son have had all these things on their head. Um, and it's good that two of us on the team were mothers. It's actually unusually three women on that team. And we could say that we wouldn't ask you to do this. We could also unwrap the headgear and put it on the mother's arms and say, look, it's not hot. It's not going to burn or anything. So this little boy is looking at the video. And you could probably just see just then he was doing, he's watching somebody do peekaboo in this mirror here. Which that's showing what he's seeing. And his behavior is so engaging. And at the end of this little thing, he actually does a little peekaboo himself. So it's really clear that he's engaging with this, um, this situation. And so the data that we're collecting is showing us what's going on in, in his brain. But it's, I think it's a great video to say how accessible uh, this technology is in an age group that is conventionally very difficult to measure. Because if he doesn't like what he's doing, he will get, off and walk off, get up and walk off. So all the engineering making the headgear, there he is, he's doing his little peekaboo. So we came back from these various trips. And I said to Sarah, you need to write a paper because this is a first and we need to get this published quickly. So Sarah wrote a paper that was published in Nature Scientific Reports detailing the studies that we'd done in the Gambia. And I knew that we were the, on the edge of a, a different type of application of brain imaging. 
So I established an initiative called Global Ethnies with the intention of providing information to the global health community about the opportunities of this brain imaging, but also to the brain imaging community to say, you need to start looking at the challenges that are being faced in global health and see if we can address some of these. This was a lot of work, and I decided in 2013 to take a sabbatical, which took me all over the world because I needed to immerse myself in the world of global health because I didn't know anything about this. And as part of that sabbatical, I ended up in the Gates Foundation in Seattle, the headquarters. And I found myself in a poster session. Uh, there were 400 posters in that session. Um, and I was chatting away to a guy at my poster who was interested in what I was doing. And then the next thing I knew, this, this, this was the guy that I was talking to. So Bill Gates, it was like Elvis came into the building. He just appeared. No warning. And I was with a colleague of mine who took this picture and timed the interaction, which was seven and a half minutes. So I had seven and a half minutes to convince Bill Gates that this was a great project. He's a tech guy, right? So he didn't really need selling on the tech. Um, but I, again, this photo reminds me of the importance of public engagement. And Robert was very kind to, to list some of the awards that I've uh, received for public engagement. And I think that's because it's really important. You just need to be able to explain to anyone what you're doing, and particularly to the world's richest man, if you want to get some money out of his pockets. Um, so this conversation, a site visit to London, a huge amount of work by the whole team, uh, led to some significant funding from Bill Gates and the establishment of the Bright Project, which is the Brain Imaging for Global Health Project. And the aim of this project is threefold. First of all, to characterise the trajectory of brain development in both typical and atypical um, development in infants that have experienced adversity to identify early biomarkers of when that brain development is disrupted, and then to inform targeted interventions to protect the baby's brains. And so the study is involved recruiting 225 babies in the Gambia and 60 babies in the UK. And it started off with us following these babies up from birth to two years of age, as we'd done in the pilot. Um, but then Sarah and Sophie worked incredibly hard, Sarah Lloyd-Fox and Sophie Moore, Sarah, a developmental psychologist, Sophie, an international nutrition expert, in getting more money out of Gates to add on bright kids. So now the study expands all the way up to five years of age, which is an important age because it's preschool, so we get a preschool marker. So the Bright study encompasses a range of different measures. It's the broadest measurement uh, cohort of any global health study looking at brain development. And we look at home visits, uh, we're looking at caregiving practices, we're looking at measuring the brain both with near infrared spectroscopy and EEG, we're looking at behavioural measures, parent-child interaction questionnaires, health questionnaires, parental mental health, growth measures, biological samples, DNA, you name it, we're measuring it. So it's a huge project um, with uh, the most dedicated team to make all of this work. And rather than singling out any particular output, we, I'm just giving you a snapshot here, and I think this slide is already out of date when I looked at it this morning. I think there's at least two more papers that I should add to this. So the next tranche of funding, which we've just secured, we're just about to sign the contracts on from Gates, is for the third phase, which we're going to call Bright Impact. How do we take all that data? How do we take all the learning from this project? How do we take what we've understood about, first of all, making measurements in that environment, but also what we're seeing about the trajectory of brain development in the two different populations? and really create tools that can be very widely available um, global health tools. That's already happening through the Global Ethnies Initiative. We have studies happening in Bangladesh. And we now have, a, I think, a really special uh, example of now cross-population, cross-cultural measures uh, where we can do exactly the same measurements in three different populations and look at the comparisons between brain development in those populations. And I sort of set a call to arms for the rest of the Near Infrared community at a conference in, after I'd met Bill Gates. And I said, right, you need to start speaking to global health people in your institutions and understand what their challenges are and see if we can really address them. Um, and so now this whole Global Ethnias initiative has really taken off with, as you can see, studies happening all over the world. And this brilliant initiative now, which I love from the Ivory Coast, which is the pop-up mobile brain imaging lab. And this isn't hard to do, it's complicated, but the technology is available to allow us to do this and to get to some of these populations. These kids are working in cocoa farms, they don't have access to any education, so we're looking at the impact of their um, low levels of literacy on their brain development. And also, I think another real game changer 
Sophie Moore, who I've already mentioned, uh, was able to secure significant funding from the Wellcome Trust <coughs> to start the first intervention, so nutritional intervention of infants of the type that I've described, where we're using the markers from our Bright project as outcome measures. So we'll really start to understand now whether we can create effective interventions in these groups. I guess the ambition doesn't stop. So I put this picture up of a field assistant who works in the region of the Gambia where we do our studies. And he goes out and consents and recruits the babies and the mothers. And I guess what I'd really like to achieve is to put a brain imaging system on the back of this motorbike, a solar-powered brain imaging system. So rather than having the babies having to come into the clinic to have the measurements done, we can just have the brain imaging system go out to them. So you can imagine that this type of project takes a huge amount of dedicated people, and I'm extraordinarily lucky that we have all of these people, both in the UK and Africa, working on this project. And I've shown you some of the research outputs from this project, but I think it's important to say also that as leaders of these types of projects, we're also responsible for the career development of our groups. And so I'm enormously proud, and I think this is again out of date. I think we have four completed PhDs with three in progress, uh, our team have, support, have uh, achieved enormously really impactful things with the funding that they've drawn in from a range of different fellowships and also academic promotions. And with the exception of, of one person who's in the audience, I've just seen Liam, where are you Liam, who's one of the PhD students, he's doing incredibly well. The, all the other accomplishments on this side are with female engineers and physicists and, and psychologists. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about women in science, but one of the things that we can really do is empower women to become their own leaders in their own fields um, and give them the opportunity to reach their full potential. And it is possible. This was the first time I'd, I'd led an almost exclusively female team, and I'm enormously proud of everything um, that they've achieved. So, meanwhile, um, as you can tell, I had to talk about this project to lots of different audiences, and I wanted to understand more about how I should really engage with different audiences, particularly a more general public around this work. So I applied for and secured a, a British Science Association Media Fellowship, and that involved me being seconded to the Financial Times in London, uh, writing a range of different science... Uh, I was a jobbing science journalist for the summer, uh, some of on, on topics which I knew well, others on things I absolutely knew absolutely nothing about, like carbon capture and genetics. I came off that experience and I actually met Nigel, who I think has joined us online, who's the dean of the faculty, and I met him at a graduation ceremony. And I was absolutely so enthused by the work I was doing at the Financial Times. And I said, Nigel, we've got to find a way of bringing this back to the faculty so that we can really empower people to talk about their work to a range of different audiences. Um, and so we had a long chat, and it was from that conversation and others that the role of Vice Dean for Impact was created, and I'm really honoured to currently be in that role, so representing the incredible work that's happening across the whole of the engineering faculty um, to a range of different audiences. So I guess this is my career timeline in summary, and a couple of things about this. None of it was expected or particularly planned, um, but I think the opportunity for me to work part-time when I needed to with the support of people like Dave and Jem Hebden, who you'll hear from later, was incredibly important. I'm a great believer in work-life balance, and I'm very relieved that I was able to have that time that I did as my children were growing up. So I worked part-time for a total of 18 years, um, and only relatively recently um, started working full-time. So I've talked about our responsibilities of really bringing on our own research groups. So I just want to end the talk by talking about other types of responsibilities that we might have as medical physicists and engineers. The first is to the next generation of scientists who are going to do all the things that we're too stupid to do. They are going to solve the problems that we've created. So we have to invest in them. And so I'm really proud that my initial association with the London International Youth Science Forum when I was 17 has resulted in me returning to the forum as its academic president. And we now have attracted the Princess Royal as our royal patron. The event's actually happening next week. We're expecting over 400 students from over 80 countries. The first speaker is a Nobel Prize winner. We have a Nobel Prize winning speaker now every year. The students are in for an amazing time, and they're going to be exposed to world-leading science. And because of my involvement in the forum, but also because of the work that I've done in Africa, I looked out on one of the talks I was giving at the forum a few years ago and thought, where are all the African students? 
They're just not in the room. And so together with my late husband, Tim Rook, we established this small charity called uh, Young Scientists for Africa. And so this provides scholarships to enable uh, talented young scientists from all over Africa to attend the forum and take their place as the, the youngest continent on the planet and the fastest growing continent on the planet. These are the people that we should be investing in for the future of their science and the future of science in the world. And this is just some of the, the students that we've we sponsored. There's Tonya from Zimbabwe and Amy from Kenya and Rebecca from Kenya with a big smile and, and Gracious from Tanzania and Pamela from South Africa. And again, I'm really proud of the number of female scientists that we have um, on our scholarships as well. So I think there are ways of paying back. Um, sometimes, you know, they're not obvious, but when they, represent, when they present themselves to you, it's really important that you take them up. So I've mentioned my husband, Tim, who was an enormous support in this charity. Those of you that, that know Tim uh, will know that I was with, married to Tim for 31 years. Um, in November of 2020, Tim had a cycling accident and he suffered a catastrophic brain injury. Um, it threw me into a world that I knew well from a professional perspective, but now I found myself as a relative, not as a professor. And it was a journey that I never expected to go on. This is just a flowchart of um, a, a representation of what happens to people who have a severe brain injury. Tim went into, it was unconscious at the scene. Uh, and so I was thrown into this world of trying to understand what it was going to mean for him and our family. But I was extraordinarily lucky to have Martin Smith literally on speed dial, who would have literally hours and hours and hours of conversation with me about the situation, about the clinical perspective. And Tim had his accident in November of 2020. He had a, an injury called a diffuse axonal injury, which is probably the worst kind of, to prognosticate. It's very difficult to understand what the likely outcome of this injury will be. But it became apparent that for Tim, he wasn't somebody that was going to emerge and regain consciousness. And Tim dies in February of 2021. And really, that experience, as you can imagine, as traumatic and life-changing as it was, really got me thinking about whether I could indeed return to work. Um, but it was the support, the unwavering support of Nigel, the dean, Andy, the head of department, and everyone else around me that gave me the opportunity to have a sabbatical. And it was during that sabbatical that I was given space and time to think about what my next steps might be. During that sabbatical, I was contacted by a group that had actually managed Tim's end-of-life care or been instrumental in, in that. Um, and one of the groups that they work with, which is the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Centre, led by Jenny Kitzinger at Cardiff University. This is a multidisciplinary group of researchers that look at the cultural, ethical, legal and societal dimensions of coma and other disorders of consciousness and look into how support can be given to understand really what feeds into decision-making in these very complex situations and also the support that can be provided to relatives. And as I started to look into this, when I had time to do so on the sabbatical, I realised that this was a really important area for people to understand who were trying to help. And one group that have been trying to help are those people developing brain imaging systems to see whether they could image people's brains to understand what the likely trajectory is for people in recovering or not consciousness. Now, I apologise this is a complicated slide, but that's sort of no apology because it's a complicated topic. But this slide just outlines some of the uh, brain imaging uh, studies that have been um, positioned at patients who are unconscious. And you can see that there's lots of different studies, there's lots of different paradigms that have been used. And if you can see, I've just highlighted some of the sort of summary results. So an example here is that 33% of unresponsive patients showed a positive response. And that's the, uh, that's the terminology that's used in these, um, in these studies. There is a huge gap in understanding between what a positive response means uh, for that patient. Does it mean a meaningful recovery? Does it even mean that the patient is likely to become aware again? Is it an artifact of the imaging? What does that actually mean? And this is a very young part of our science. This paper was published this year. Um, so we're looking at a new era of brain imaging in these patients that are really, uh, groups are trying to get to the essence of what, um, what we're understanding about consciousness. 
And I guess now I've got a personal perspective on this. The one thing that I can say as a relative, it's, that it's incredibly complex, it's ugly, it's dynamic, but most of all, it's uncertain. And so even me, who knows the reality and the facts and could face the, the reality of our situation, couldn't help but hang on every word about where there was any hope of some information that might tell me what might happen. And so it's a very emotionally heightened atmosphere for relatives and for the doctors looking after the patients. And so we have to bear in mind that as physicists and engineers and developers of brain imaging systems, this is unlike many other clinical situations we will find ourselves in. The stakes for these patients are incredibly high. They're the highest stakes. It's basically life or death decision making. And if these types of data are being used to inform those decisions, we have to be incredibly careful. This is a quote that comes from a national clinical guidelines from the Royal College of Physicians, which is, I think sums it up. So while it is acknowledged there is a small cohort of patients who presently behaviorally present behaviorally as being in a vegetative state, but demonstrate covert responses with an imaging scanner, the prognostic significance of these findings is yet, as yet unclear. And this raises the ethical dilemma of whether or not how to disclose this information to clinicians and patients' families. So it comes back to what I've discussed all the way through my talk. We can measure things. Is it the thing that we actually need to know that we're measuring, first of all? What's the relationship, the important relationship like between the people that are driving those brain imaging studies and the clinical teams looking after the patients? And how is the data interpreted and communicated both to the clinical teams and the relatives in this very heightened emotional context? And uh, this is something that I've obviously become very interested in. As part of my sabbatical, I was introduced to the Brochere Foundation. And this is a foundation, a philanthropic foundation that's uh, situated on the beautiful spot on the shores of Lake Geneva that looks into the ethical, legal, and societal implications of new medical and health developments. And uh, Jenny Kitson just said, you might want to consider spending some time there on a residency, thinking about this problem and maybe doing some writing. So I was lucky enough to secure a writing residency fellowship in March of this year. And the title for my fellowship was Responsible Neuroimaging for End-of-Life Decision-Making in Patients with Prolonged Disorders of Consciousness. And you can see the setting that I spent a month in, uh, absolutely idyllic and the perfect place to really think over this very difficult material and think about how I might be able to contribute with the combination of personal and professional experience. So I wrote a number of things. One of the things that I wrote has just been published this month in the Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology. It's an editorial which is looking at uh, the use of functional neuroimaging in patients with disorders of consciousness. And you can see that the caveat that I've put there is caution is advised. Um, and I've written this purely from a professional, not a personal standpoint. And the points that I raise in this editorial is that we have the following issues to consider. The choice of imaging modality must be guided by the status of the patient and not all imaging modalities are equal in this setting. We need to really understand whether protocols that have been exclusively developed for conscious awake patients are suitable for use in unconscious patients. And I should say that some of the protocols that are used to elicit responses in unconscious patients, there's one protocol that's being used, 25% of um, awake volunteers don't, don't show any responses. Uh, with that particular protocol. So, you know, we have, to, we have to make sure these protocols are appropriate. We're often used to presenting, as I have today, group data, but now we have to uh, interpolate that tr group data down to the individual patient level. And there's a clinical decision, sometimes a life and death based decision, on the data that we're presenting for that individual patient. That's a very big difference from publishing a paper that's got group statistics surrounding it. There is a scarcity of outcome data. There are very few studies where the outcomes have been follow up. And the, the nature of this, it's very difficult. Some of these patients will die. And so we don't know what their full outcome may have been or not. And again, as I've already mentioned, the way in which we discuss and communicate these technologies is really has to be borne in mind the expectations of the relatives. Because whatever we think, and however reasonable and sensible and rational we may be, in that situation, it's very hard to not become incredibly emotional about the idea of a technology giving you an answer that you're craving. Um, it's not a magic bullet. So I think we, you know, that's where the caution needs to come from. 
So broadening out this idea of the responsibility that we have in developing technologies, we have to acknowledge that brain imaging has become democratised in the last few years. There are many companies now, well-established near-infrared companies, who are developing wearable systems for a range of different applications. And interestingly, the big players are in the game too. So you're probably familiar with the Neuralink initiative from Elon Musk. Uh, Meta are in the game as well. A company called Kernel, the $50 million Fitbit. Um, and what I spent some time doing at 5 o'clock this morning was looking at these websites and frankly trying to understand their mission statement. So let's look at Neuralink. Neuralink wants to create a generalised brain interface to restore autonomy to those with unmet needs, medical needs today, and unlock human potential tomorrow. I mean, I've worked in brain imaging for a long time, but I've absolutely no idea what that means. <laughs> um, and the idea that Colonel... I'm, I'm not dissing any of these initiatives. I'm just saying let's be careful about what are we asking them to do, what do they think they're doing, and do we need it? The idea that better data means better brains, I don't know what the definition of a better brain is. The idea of a Fitbit measuring brain health, I have no idea how I would determine brain health in a subject. So these systems are very easy now to engineer, um, and so we need to be aware that they're going to be used for lots of different purposes. And of course we need to be aware that there's a commercial imperative here. So this also from the Colonel website, asking for recruits for volunteers for studies in looking at altered states of consciousness. Uh, some of those, I think, using ketamine. And also, a really big driver in this field now is the gaming industry. Um, so we have the coincidence of well-funded initiatives, uh, commercial imperatives, a very enticing idea that we can put these systems on and understand our brains. Um, and that's something that we need to watch. And I'm not the only person that thinks that. So this is a report published by the Royal Society. And the Royal Society acknowledges that there are profound ethical, political, social, and commercial questions that need to be addressed as soon as possible. And we need to regulate these technologies. And they have a call to action, which unsurprisingly includes multidisciplinary collaborations, early and often ethical considerations, and public consultations. Now, I only started looking at this because of the experience that I had and my thoughts around the use of brain imaging. I don't think we're teaching this. I don't think we're putting this on our syllabuses in understanding the fact that just because we can create a technology, should we, and how should we use it? And also, the Organisation for Economic and Cooperative Development have created a guidelines for responsible innovation in neurotechnology. And nine very sensible points on here promoting responsible innovation, safety, inclusivity, collaboration, social deliberation, capacity for advisory bodies, safeguarding of data, stewardship, and monitoring misuse. But we should be doing that as standard, but I don't actually know where that's happening because when I go to brain imaging conferences and I've been the president of a, a society for brain imaging, I can't see this being represented on any of the programmes. And so I think it's time that we add these into the discussions, not just about how good we are at developing systems, it's about understanding our ethical responsibilities about how they're used. So finally, I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, it's impossible to have given this talk without the work of the people on this slide and many others, actually, and I'm sorry for those that I've omitted. Um, and it's been a pleasure working with all of these different teams um, over 30 years. And at a personal level, I'd like to thank, first of all, my brothers. Um, Simon is here, and my other brother, John, is online. And uh, I showed this picture at my inaugural. I'm not going to look at him, because he's going to be crying. <laughs> and um, I think I said at my inaugural, my brothers have always held me up, even when I didn't want to be, like in this picture. Um, but I will just say that in the last two years, um, if they hadn't have held me up, I, I wouldn't be here today. Um, for my mum, who's amazing, who's also here, and I'm not looking at her either. Um, my mum taught me something early in my life, which I've held on to. She taught me it isn't about being confident, it's about being brave. And I think that's incredibly important. Women are always told you're not confident enough, you should increase your confidence, but do this to increase your confidence. There's lots of days I don't feel confident, I didn't feel very confident this morning, but I think it's about just being brave sometimes when you're not feeling confident. And also, my relentlessly awesome children, our children, Julia and Joseph, for trusting and believing in me that the sun would come out again one day. And finally, this is definitely where I'm going to lose it, um, the two men who uh, I've lost who have 
helped me more than anyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Well, it's, it's an honour for me to uh, be asked to give the vote of thanks uh, for, for, this, for this wonderful talk. I've, I've known Claire for all that 30 years. I think we joined within a year of each other. And it's been an honour to have been her colleague over, over that time. I just want to add something that uh, I personally feel about, about Claire is, is her ability as a communicator, which we've seen today. Not only, not only is she a brilliant scientist, but she is a... a uh, a world-leading communicator. She is outstanding, and she inspires people. In fact, um, while you came up with the title Blood, Babies, and Bill Gates, I was thinking there, thinking maybe your talk should be People, Passion, and Princess Anne. <laughs> uh, I, I've been with you, and you've met Princess Anne on at least three different separate occasions. I, I see there's at least a fourth. Yeah. You're becoming quite She's a, stalking me, what can I you're say? You're becoming a family friend, so yeah. that, that, that's good to hear. No, she, she has been an inspiration to all of us, all of her colleagues, to her students, to her undergraduates. And that's really important. And you can see why today in this talk she is just an awesome communicator. And uh, she had no notes. She was speaking um, because it, for, for, with, the, with the passion she has in her heart for her work and because she wants to communicate. She sees that as being very important. Anyway, so I express my, my thanks to Claire. Do you, there, do you want to take any questions? If, yeah, do, if we have yeah. time. Are, are there any know. questions at all from, from, from the audience? Which maybe one or two. I can't believe Dave doesn't have a question. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, when you find working in a hospital is going to a lab to do The difference between working at a hospital and working in a lab. Um, uh, if you're having a bad day in one, you might be having a good day in the other one. That's a bit like the work-home balance. Um, you know, the... The obvious thing is, I think in one of the collaborations where I did with Martin, it was managing expectations from both of those environments. So clinicians uh, will typically underestimate how long it takes to get ethics for a study, and engineers will definitely underestimate how long it's going to take to engineer a system. So it's understanding managing expectations. I think the other thing that's super important is understanding the local rules. So when you go into a clinical environment, there is a much stronger hierarchy than we have in engineering and physics, uh, quite rightly. And so just, again, observing and listening and understanding where everyone fits into that is really important. And, you know, you know obviously, I'd worked in a neurointensive care unit for many years before I became a relative. But it's to remember they're real people's lives, and they're going through the most, sometimes the most difficult periods of their life. And you asking those relatives, or Martin asking those relatives, to consent for their, uh, their loved one to be a, a volunteer in a study for which will be of no benefit to them. It will just go into a paper that's a group statistic, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think we just need to remember that, that we are asking people to do something that's really very precious and very important, and we should be ultimately respectful. And I always learned a lot from Martin, who was the, really the gatekeeper in that environment of, of looking after his patients and the relatives. Um, so we, we need to remember that. Be respectful. Time for one more question. Perhaps. Can I just make Thanks. a suggestion? Yes. Which is... With, Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> with, with the portal system that you've got now, it would be really interesting to wear one of these while you're giving this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> she is. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, where's Elias? Where is he? So, Ilias, you've done loads of... You've had people walking around Queen Square with yeah. them on and doing all sorts of things. And we did, the, we did an anagram study, Dave, in the lab, where we got um, people in the lab to solve anagrams because we wanted to look at the impact of uh, people's blood pressure being raised. Um, and it was awful. I mean, you know, academics trying to solve anagrams and competitive and, you know, almost their heads were blow blowing off. So, um, you know, I think the serious point around this is that, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing, Ilias and many other people here, we've tried to make brain imaging, bring it to the point where you don't know you're having your brain imaged. You know, that's it's the quantum mechanics thing. You know, you're going to change something by observing it. So you want to make sure that as much as possible, people don't know they're having their brain imaged. And that's really important in something like the toddler lab, 
we want to study these toddlers in their natural environment and not have their behaviour influenced by the fact that they're having their brain monitored. So, that, yeah, there's a very serious point about the different environments we can do that in. I'm not sure I want Elon Musk having my data, though. <laughs> Just saying. I'd like to suggest that maybe we wire up the audience. Wire up the audience. Yeah, yeah. see who's awake. We can see their signals. Say who's awake, yeah. Yeah, yeah. see who's yeah. awake. <laughs> OK, uh, well, so th I just want to express our uh, thanks on behalf of everyone here for a fantastic talk. Thanks to Naomi and Robert for arranging this event today. It's, it's been fantastic. And if we just finish with a round of applause for Claire. <laughs> <laughs>